the first thing we we probably have to uh, we have to accept is that aluminium is toxic now toxicity takes many different forms and in many ways today we learn about new forms of toxicity of aluminium with time with more research so for example 30 or 40 years ago we knew that aluminium killed fish in lakes or trees affected by acid rain but we perhaps knew that there were unusual circumstances where humans could be affected by aluminium a good example of that was something called dialysis encephalopathy this was where individuals who had kidney failure and were having their blood cleaned by dialysis had aluminium inadvertently introduced into their body and into their brain through the tap water that was used to clean their blood and we know that this went to their brain and caused massive loss of cells massive loss of neurons many people died from this but this is sort of considered to be a, an unusual event uh, an acute event not for years people didn't consider this to be an example of how aluminium could be toxic but just a one-off something that you just had to avoid doing we've now moved on from that we now have to accept that not only does aluminium kill fish in lakes and trees and have unusual effects in dialysis and cephalopathy but that aluminium is toxic wherever it is it has the potential to produce toxicity if aluminium is in your brain it can produce neurodegeneration problems associated with your brain if it is in your bone it will produce bone disease wherever it is it has the potential to produce toxicity in humans as much as in fish or any other living organism and I think to a certain extent you know this is not widely accepted because maybe of a fear or something or not wanting to accept the reality now the reality that aluminium is toxic does not mean that it is toxic under all circumstances we're talking about the potential its ability to produce an effect under certain sets of conditions two individuals could have very similar amounts of aluminium in their body one of those individuals would be suffering the toxic effects of aluminium and the other one wouldn't and that's because of the differences in the physiology between those individuals simple differences in uh, these can be genetic differences they can be simply down to um, the way that someone is feeling at a moment in time or the history of medical history of these individuals and of course largely what we have to accept now is that in every cell in our body you have some aluminium and that aluminium is actually exerting some sort of you can call it toxicity if you like or you can just call it a pressure because it has no function but because it's biologically reactive then the body must be dealing with it it must do something it must respond biologically which gen generally means you're using up energy to deal with that aluminium that's in the body so we are all experiencing that and then you know you move on to another sort of level from that you move on to a situation where for example if you were predisposed to let's move on to a controversial subject Alzheimer's disease and right now we don't understand what most of the pre 
predispositions to this disease are, we know very few, then we know that aluminium can contribute to the same types of neuropathology, brain pathology as you get in Alzheimer's. And we've got good evidence now that what can happen is that aluminium can be responsible for making a disease occur more early, an early onset. We know that it can make the disease more aggressive, it can progress more rapidly, and indeed you may get a disease like Alzheimer's disease because aluminium is present, whereas you may not have got it at all because you may have died before your 90s or whenever it was going to happen. In other words, aluminium is contributing to ongoing systems or physiological problems within all of us. Um, and you can't, you know, we've got to start to accept that. And what we need to now understand, not, you know, we, we will not be able to take aluminium out of our lives. But we, would, we can manage it if we understand and, and start to accept these toxicities and how we, for example, in our everyday life should try to reduce our exposure wherever possible. You know, you know that I talk about this thing called the age of aluminium or the aluminium age. This will not go away because aluminium has been so useful to us and it really remains incredibly useful to us. But we should be able to use it safely and effectively, and that's what I believe, that we can live safely and effectively in the aluminium age. But to do that, more than me have got to say, yes, aluminium is toxic, aluminium is a problem, we do need to think about it, we do need to take it into account. I talk about something called the body burden of aluminium. And it's very important that we recognize what that really means. And the body burden of aluminium is all aluminium which is in contact with our body by whatever means. Traditionally, people think aluminium is only a problem if it's in the bloodstream or gets inside the body. This is, this is not you know, a good biological rationale for understanding how aluminium impacts upon human health. So when you look at the ways in which we, we are exposed, there is the obvious one, which is of course through our diet, through our gut, through what we eat and what we drink. But there are less obvious ones. There are, for example, uh, simply what we take into our lungs, what we breathe on a regular basis. This is actually, actually quite a lot of aluminium. And that aluminium moves into the lung, into the surfaces of the lung, and from there, it, some of it will get removed and will end up in our, in our gut, but other parts of it will get absorbed across the gut, across the gut, across the lung. Then of course we have our nose, our olfactory system, and again, that's another route of absorption. We have our skin. Now our skin is a much uh, underrated route of absorption or at least exposure to aluminium. And what you've got to imagine is that once you've got some aluminium on the surface of the skin, it's not, it's not important that all of that aluminium goes through and into the bloodstream. It is remaining within the skin where it is biologically available, where it can be biologically reactive, where it can also act as a source of biologically available aluminium. Now what this tells us is that what we need to appreciate is that, for example, when one receives aluminium in an adjuvant, whether in vaccination or indeed in immunotherapy, that aluminium is injected into a certain compartment within the body, where it might be into the muscle or the subcutaneous fluid or area, but that injection of aluminium in that particular location you know, cannot be considered as equivalent to an exposure to aluminium which might be going via the lung or via the gut or through the nose. It is a completely different type of exposure. It's not equivalent. You cannot just 
add up the amounts of aluminium that are in an adjuvant preparation and say, look, that's very small compared to what you eat, therefore it's irrelevant. No, it's a totally different form of exposure and it must be treated like a different form so that we understand exposure in that form. And until we do that, again, we will not understand any possible or probable uh, toxicity that might come from adjuvant aluminium. I think Al Gore wrote a book once called The Convenient Truth or something about global warming. Well, it's also convenient, really, for these organizations to ignore this. It, the information is not out there for them to go into the scientific literature and find this. That is certain. There is some information, but they cannot answer these questions yet. But we have not actually carried out the experiments which are required to understand these phenomena. You know, I've worked on aluminium for 30 years now, this year, 30 years of thinking about aluminium. And it take, it's taken me 30 years of thinking about aluminium to understand it to this level. So these people are not understanding it at the level I understand it. And so they don't appreciate what I can appreciate and they're not able to recognize the type of science and the type of experiments that need to be done for us to understand it, not just appreciate the possible dangers, but understand it. So they are either putting their heads in the sand because it's convenient to do so, or they're you know, politically driven or something because they cannot make these statements as scientists thinking that, you know, they have applied their usual scientific rigor to making those statements, and I'm sure they would agree with me. Well, w one of the things that my group are trying to understand is how do aluminium adjuvants work? Uh, and we're not there yet, but we are beginning to understand more about them. But we're looking at the simple things like when you inject an, ad an adjuvant, what is its fate? What happens to it? And what happens to it relative to the antigen that it was injected with? And so, for example, we're about to be able to publish what we think for the first time, unequivocal evidence that, yes, immune cells do come to the site of injection. They do take up aluminium particles and they will transport them elsewhere. Now, many other groups, including here in this group with the uh, Girardi's group, have postulated this and have used other ways to show that this may happen. And indeed, that this aluminium could be taken to the brain. And indeed, our results support that. So in other words, once you've had aluminium at an injection site, there is then now the potential for it to go more or less anywhere in the body. And I always say, look, if it's such an effective adjuvant at an injection site, why isn't it an effective adjuvant elsewhere? So if particulate aluminium gets carried in, into the brain or something of that sort, it can act as an adjuvant there, can't it? Could it not induce the type of inflammatory response that you see at the site of an injection in any other tissue where that adjuvant material ends up because of being carried there? And probably, you know, the, the simple answer to how an, ad, an aluminium adjuvant works at the moment is, you know, we've tended to use very high doses, very high doses of aluminium adjuvants. And it's probably primarily toxic, toxicity at the site of injection. And for the majority, that toxicity is no more than an inflammation, a red mark. But for some, that toxicity spreads, that toxicity is manifested somewhere else. We know this to be the case. So, in majority of people, you would feel that probably uh, there are no you know, the immediate effects of an aluminium adjuvant are limited. But, a, but bearing in mind that usually very high numbers of people are vaccinated, then if if one percent of people are suffering a worse type of response and that can work out to be tens of thousands of people or 
if you're receiving significant numbers of vaccinations with aluminium adjuvant at a very young age, as we know happens with children, young children, infants and babies, this is actually quite a significant load of aluminium which can then get transported around the body. You know, when you take in aluminium via your gut, and again, the, we don't know exactly what proportion of aluminium from the gut goes into the blood, but even so, quite a high proportion of that has to go through the liver. And the liver is very effective at essentially being a, a big detoxification unit for the body. But any aluminium goes in as an adjuvant doesn't have to go through the liver. It can go straight to somewhere else. So a high proportion of that aluminium can go directly to possible target sites to produce toxicity. And aluminium is used so much is because it is so effective it's so good and of course it's very cheap but I think you know one has to begin to accept that some individuals either within a short time or after a, a, a longer period of time will suffer a consequence of aluminium as an adjuvant and probably again you know, my feeling on this is that Aluminium adjuvants could be uh, made, could be manufactured in a different way to make them equally effective and much safer. In other words, we could still use a cheap ingredient, but we could, uh, um, we, and we could, if we understood the mechanisms better, we could make sure that all that is doing is what we want it to do, and very little else. So I'm quite confident that that could be done. But it's like what I said earlier, before you start to address these issues, somebody has to stand up and say, it is a problem. You know, it is a problem. And when someone eventually does that, then we will start to make progress. And it doesn't mean we have to get rid of aluminium necessarily, even in adjuvants. It means we have to recognize that we don't yet understand exactly how they work, but we can find that out. Research will tell us that. And secondly then, how can we use them effectively and safely? And it's the same is true for all of our exposure to aluminium. One message only is, look, we must all now accept that when aluminium is in our body, it is potentially toxic wherever it is. It can produce damage wherever it is. What we need to understand then is why certain individuals perhaps are more susceptible, why certain sets of conditions maybe see a condition manifested more, to be more likely to be manifested. You know, under what set of conditions is aluminium safe and effective? Under what set of conditions is it not? And perhaps can we do some, so for example, could we have some preliminary um, um, monitoring of some sort of, of let's say, Let's say we wanted to give uh, aluminium adjuvants to children as we do in vaccination. If we could just check something, if we could monitor something about the child in advance to see whether we thought they would be more susceptible or not. And same for adults, but for children in particular being much more vulnerable. I think that's possible too. In other words, to identify those sets of people, children and otherwise, who could respond badly and look for alternatives for them, not just give everybody the same thing.